Hey there YouTube, Grante here, and welcome back to the show. Uh, today on the agenda is another audiobook, or rather it's an audiobook we've done before, but I mean, my voice has changed and I really enjoy this book, so we're gonna redo The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Uh, break through the blocks and win your inner creative battles. It's a book that I enjoy. I usually reread this one once a year, maybe every other year. It's 150 pages, and how this work is split up is into three books in and of itself, each one addressing a different part of the War of Art. We're going to look at each book individually, and each one's made up of a bunch of little essays, but they're great, and I hope that you enjoy this book as much as I have. Thanks for watching. This video is part of an audiobook series featuring The War of Art in 2002 by Stephen Pressfield. Break through the blocks and win your inner creative battles. For more audiobooks, visit my YouTube channel, find me on Spotify, or check out my website for downloads. The War of Art. What I do. I get up. I take a shower. I have breakfast. I read the paper and brush my teeth. If I have phone calls to make, I make them. I've got my coffee now. I put on my lucky work boots and stitch up the lucky laces that my niece Meredith gave me. I head back to the office, crank up the computer. My lucky hooded sweatshirt is draped over the chair with the lucky charm I got from a gypsy in Saint Marie de la Mer for only eight bucks in francs. And my lucky Largo name tag that came from a dream I once had. I put it on. On my thesaurus is my lucky cannon that my friend Bob Versandi gave me from Morro Castle, Cuba. I point it toward my chair so it can fire inspiration into me. I say my prayer, which is the Invocation of the Muse from Homer's Odyssey, translation by T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, which my dear mate Paul Rink gave me, and which sit, sits near my shelf with the cufflinks that belong to my, bob, to my father and my lucky acorn, from the battlefield at Thermopylae. It's about 10.30 now. I sit down and plunge in. When I start making typos, I know that I'm getting tired. That's four hours or so. I've hit the point of diminishing returns. I wrap up for the day, copy whatever I've done to disc and stash the disc in the glove compartment of my truck in case there's a fire and I have to run for it. I power down. It's 3.33 and the office is now closed. How many pages have I produced? I don't care. Are they any good? I don't even think about it. All that matters is I've put in my time and hit it with all I've got. All that counts is that for this day, for this session, I have overcome resistance. What I know. There's a secret that real writers know that wannabe writers don't. And the secret is this. It's not the writing hard part that's hard. What's hard is sitting down to write. And what keeps us from sitting down is resistance. The unlived life. Most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life between us. Between the two stands resistance. Have you ever brought home a treadmill and let it gather dust in the attic? Ever quit a diet, a course of yoga, a meditation practice? Have you ever bailed out on a call to embark upon a spiritual practice, dedicate yourself to a humanitarian calling, commit your life to the service of others, have you ever wanted to be a doctor, a mother, an advocate for the weak and helpless, to run for office, crusade for the planet, campaign for world peace, or to preserve the environment? Late at, late at night, have you experienced the vision of the person you might become, the work you could accomplish, the realized being you were meant to be? Are you a writer who doesn't write, a painter who doesn't paint, an entrepreneur who never starts a venture? Then you know what resistance is. And we have a little poem Quote, one night I was laying down. I heard Papa talking to Mama. I heard Papa say to let that boy boogie woogie, cause it's in him and it's gotta come out. End quote from John Lee Hooker, Boogie Chillin'. Resistance is the most toxic force on the planet. It is the root of more unhappiness than poverty, disease, and erectile dysfunction. To yield to resistance deforms our spirit. It stunts us and makes us less than we are and were born to be. If you believe in God, and I do, you must declare resistance evil, for it prevents us from achieving the life God intended when he endowed us with each of our own genius. Genius is a Latin word. The Romans used it to denote an inner spirit, holy and inviolable, which watches over us, guiding us to our calling. A writer writes with his genius, an artist paints with hers. 
everyone who creates operates from this sacramental center. It is our soul's seat, the vessel that holds our being in potential, our star's beacon and Polaris. Every sun casts a shadow and genius's shadow is resistance. As powerful as is our soul's call to realization, so potent are the forces of resistance arrayed against it. Resistance is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive and harder to kick than crack cocaine. We're not alone if we've been mowed down by resistance. Millions of good men and women have bitten the dust before us, and here's the biggest bitch. We don't even know what hit us. I never did. From age 24 to 32, resistance kicked my ass from east coast to west and back again 13 times and I never even knew it existed. I looked everywhere for the enemy and failed to see it right in front of my face. Have you heard this story? That a woman learns she has cancer with six months to live. Within days, she quits her job, resumes her, her dream of writing Tex-Mex songs she gave up to raise a family, or starts studying classical, classical Greek or moves to the inner city and devotes herself to tending babies with AIDS. The woman's friends think that she's crazy, but she herself has never been happier. And there's a postscript. The woman's cancer goes into remission. Is that what it takes? Do we have to stare death in the face to make us stand up and confront resistance? Does resistance have to cripple and disfigure our lives before we wake up to its existence? How many of us have become drunks and drug addicts, developed tumors and neuroses, succumbed to painkillers, gossip, and compulsive, compulsive cell phone use simply because we don't do that thing in our hearts our inner genius is calling us to? Resistance defeats us. If tomorrow morning, by some stroke of magic, every dazed and benighted soul woke up with the power to take the first step toward pursuing his or her dreams, every shrink in the directory would be out of business. Prisons would stand empty. The alcohol and tobacco industries would collapse along with the junk food, cosmetic surgery, and infotainment businesses, not to mention pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and the medical profession from top to bottom. Domestic abuse would become extinct as would addiction, obesity, migration headaches, road rage, and dandruff. Look in your own heart. Unless I'm crazy, right now a still small voice is piping up, telling you, as it has 10,000 times, the calling that is yours and yours alone. You know it. No one has to tell you. And unless I'm crazy, you're no closer to taking action on it than you were yesterday, or you will be tomorrow. Do you think resistance isn't real? Resistance will bury you. You know, Hitler wanted to be an artist. At 18, he took his inheritance, 700 kronen, and moved to Vienna to live and study. He applied to the Academy of Fine Arts and later to the School of Architecture. Ever seen one of his paintings? Hmm, neither have I. Resistance beat him. Call it an overstatement, but I'll say it anyway. It was easier for Hitler to start World War II than it was for him to face a blank square of canvas.